Volume Four, Chapter Ten of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith, Volume Four, Chapter Ten. After repast rather hospitable than splendid during which the looks of paternal admiration and tenderness with which the count observed every action of anzoletta and her innocent and agreeable vivacity rendered them both more attractive to willoughby monsieur de bellegarde finding that willoughby rather wished to listen to the history he had promised than to take any repose during the heat of the day proposed retiring to the north gallery and there beginning this interesting account willoughby most readily agreed to the plan and the count dismissing his daughter and her governess led him hither this room extended far on the north side of the building and looked over the moat to a wood fir and cypress fringing the abrupt ascent of the mountain which rose almost perpendicularly from the plain at this acclivity commanded the castle two strong redoubts were built on it where in hostile times parties were stationed to keep the enemy from possessing posts whence the castle might be annoyed in the portholes of these fortresses now fast approaching to the decay the cannon yet remained though rusty and useless and the strong but tresses and circular towers mantled with ivory were seen to aspire above the dark trees on every side encompassing them while a little to the west from a fractured rock of yellow granite which started out amid the trees a boiling and rapid stream rushed with violence and pouring down among the trees was seen only at intervals as they either crowded over it or receding left its foaming current to flash in the seas of the sun it was altogether one of the most sublimely beautiful landscapes willoughby had ever seen and he contemplated the scenery with pensive pleasure while the master of it thus addressed him perhaps you are so well read in the history of france as to make it unnecessary for me to remark that my family is ancient and illustrious my father the count of bellegarde was educated with every prejudice that could make him tenacious of his rank and anxious to support it he was married early by my grandfather to the heiress of the house of ermenville and his eldest son the only issue of that marriage inherited from his mother the great prosperity of that family by ambition which is which my father possessed a great share both from his temper and his education saved him not entirely from the influence of softer passions during the life of his first wife an indigent relation of his own was received into the family of one of his sisters as a dependent she was beautiful and interesting and my father being released by death from an engagement in which his heart had never any share married her and thought himself overpaid by the felicity of his second marriage for the little satisfaction he had found in the first but though he had in one instance suffered his inclinations to conquer that aspiring temper which under less powerful influence would have led him to seek for a second great heiress he seemed determined to apply himself with more acidity to the attainment of power and honour by other means he had some capacity for business was daring in forming schemes and obstinate in adhering to them proud vindictive and violent with such a portion of national pride as it made him hold every other nation 
but his own in utmost contempt and whenever they seemed likely to dispute the superiority of france he was tempted to wish like caligula that the people so presumptuous had but one neck then he might destroy them at a blow with this disposition you will easily imagine the intervercy with which he regarded the english he held a high post in the war department of france in seventeen fifty five when those hostilities commenced in which for a series of years the english had almost always the advantage events that added to a national hatred or kind of personal and peculiar malignity for of many of the operations in which his country failed of success the count of bellegarde was the projector by a long course of defeat however his master louis the fifteenth and his coadjutors grew weary of his influence and in seventeen fifty nine after the loss of quebec he was suddenly dismissed in disgrace nor was this mortification the only one he was at that period fated to sustain a violent and infectious fever at the same time deprived him of his wife and wounded thus deeply by public and domestic misfortune he took the sudden resolution of quitting the world and retiring to this castle with my brother my sister and myself hither then he came leaving at paris his eldest son who had been some time in possession of his mother's fortune and had lived entirely independent of his father and on no very friendly terms with him to the young gay and dissipated de ermenville for he took the name of his mother the austerity of a statesman and conversation of a politician were alike repulsive and he had no feelings about him that disposed him to submit to the authority of a parent from whom he had nothing to expect for it was well understood that all of the count de bellegarde either possessed from his ancestors or acquired from his political advantages de Emmeville would inherit only that share which by its being entailed his father could not deprive him the error of which the count thought he had been guilty in allowing to his eldest son early independence and boundless expense made him determine to adopt in regard to me and my brother a conduct altogether contrary on his retirement from the world my brother who was the eldest of the two and called the baron de rochemart was nearly fifteen and i was only fourteen months younger yet though at that age we should have been either pursuing our studies or with the army in which we had both commissions my father took us away with him and with a governor whom he engaged because he was the most rigid pedant he could find he fixed us both in which we then thought the desolate solitude of roach march a place which he had fixed upon for his own residence not only because it was so far from the scene of his former elevation but because it was the only one of his capital houses that was not entailed on de ermontville the gloomy solitude in which he lived the power of life and death which he possessed in his domain and the proneness of his mind to superstition which was encouraged by the monks of the neighbouring convent who soon found the advantage of having so liberal a benefactor at once darkened and soured a temper never very good accustomed to dictate and command he could not now divest himself of the habit and his vassals and his sons being the only persons over whom he could now exert it were the victims of his harsh and perilous spirit for in them he delight 
for in him he delighted to discover or to fancy faults only for the satisfaction of imposing punishment it may be easily imagined that the two lads of our ages and who had from temper and constitution a keen relish for pleasures of every kind the life we led was insupportable the mild and soft-tempered genevieve our sister who was then not more than twelve years old though from her sex and disposition more accustomed to and able to endure solitude and confinement began to feel the weight of those chains of which however she did not complain but endeavoured by her soothing sweetness to make ours sit more easily she was my father's favourite and her influence had for some time the power to assuage the harshness of his temper but by degrees even that failed of its effect and his mortified pride his lost happiness and his gloomy notions of religion combined to increase this ferocity and irritate his asperity till at length his children though the children of a woman he so fondly loved seemed to afford him nothing but objects of anger and tyranny and he was left alone to the influence of father ignatius a jesuit whom he took into his house as the director of his conscience and whose purpose it seemed to be to estrange him from his family entirely there is a point beyond which the the endurance the, of the most painful sufferer cannot go genevieve indeed was not yet arrived at this point but the baron and i had long since passed it and determined to break the settlers which in their present form we did not think even paternal authority had a right to impose the baron therefore went to de ermonville representing our situation and entreating his assistance to deliver us from it the marquis de ermonville perhaps no great affection for us he could not be totally indifferent to the re representation of the baron and felt perhaps some pleasure in being able to thwart his father where it seemed to be a sort of duty to act in opposition to him for this purpose he immediately and by way which we had pointed out to him sent us a considerable supply of money and directed us both to quit the castle in the night and find our way to perpigan where his servant and horses should attend to conduct us to paris he urged not only to the cruelty of count de bellegarde was guilty of in thus obliging us to waste the best of our days in a desert but the appearance it must have to the world that when a war was carrying on two young men enlisted in their country's service submitted to be confined like months in a cloister this remark would have been enough to have fired us with ambition and military ardour but to the incitements of honour he added the allurements of pleasure and every scruple that remained for i had still some as to leaving my father without his permission gave way before their united influence i could not however with equal success conquer the regret i felt at leaving my beloved genevieve to whom from all our earliest infancy i had been particularly attached she would we were well assure be compelled to encounter all the fury and indignation of the count when our departure should be known and when we saw her tremble with the mere apprehension of it we would very fain have obviated every difficulty that seemed to forbid our taking her with us but child as she was she answered with firmness and resolution of which her gentle temper seemed 
a little capable no my dear brother said she it is fit you should go but that i should stay no point of honour no military duty calls me and i will not desert my father he is unhappy and has need of me he must not be deprived at once of all his children and if he treats me with rigour the conscientiousness of not having deserved it will enable me to sustain it with patience it was necessary however that she should appear wholly ignorant of our flight and we dreaded that her resolution would give way when she was charged with having been acquainted with it insomuch that we should now have repented having made her a party in our secret should we have borne the thoughts of leaving abruptly and unkindly a sister whom we both so fondly loved i could not however with equal success conquer the regret i felt at leaving my beloved genevieve i felt at leaving my beloved genevieve to whom from our earliest infancy i had been particularly attached she would we were well assured be compelled to encounter all the fury and indignation of the count when our departure should be known and when we saw her tremble with the mere apprehension of it we would very fain have obviated every difficulty that seemed to forbid our taking her with us but child as she was she answered with firmness and resolution of which her gentle temper seemed little capable no my dear brother said she it is fit you should go but that i should stay no point of honour no military duty calls me and i will not desert my father he is unhappy and has need of me he must not be deprived at once of all his children and if he treats me with rigour the consciousness of not having deserved it will enable me to sustain it with patience it was necessary however that she should appear wholly ignorant of our flight and we dreaded that her resolution would give way when she was charged with having been acquainted with it insomuch that we should now have repented having made her a party in our secret could we have borne the thoughts of leaving abruptly and unkindly a sister whom we both so fondly loved at length the hour came for this cruel parting my father who since his residence here had affected all the state of a feudal baron and even many of the precautions of a besieged chief though he had no enemies to apprehend but the wolves and bears of the pyrenes not only had the drawbridge taken up every night but had a sort of guard parade at stated hours the courts of the castle our desire of liberty however surmounted all the difficulties by which our escape seemed to be impeded and by means of our sister and our own resolution we descended in safety from one of the lower windows crossed the moat which was then full in our drawers by swimming and dressing ourselves on the opposite bank we proceeded on foot to perpagan and with hearts exulting in our success and the joy it gave us allayed only by our apprehensions for genevieve our tutor had taken a fancy to wine and we took care liberally to supply him in consequence of which and the increase of pleasure he found from this easy indulgence of his favourite passion he had insensibly abated of his former strictness suffered us every evening to go to the apartment of genevieve and frequently took in our absence such plentiful potations that he was in bed and asleep before we returned to our apartments which were within his thus we were not missed till the morning and as we left no traces on our way 
and had not even entrusted a servant with our secret the pursuit that was then made for us was quite ineffectual we arrived safely at perpigan in spirits too elevated to be affected with the fatigue of our long walk we found that de Ermontville had punctually adhered to his promise and on his horses and attended by his servants we proceeded gaily to paris de Ermontville received us with more cordial friendship than i believe to be in his nature he furnished us with money to equip us for joining our respective regiments as became the sons of the count of bellegarde and assured us of his continued assistance till my father could be brought to reason it is not therefore wonderful that his friendships made us blind to his faults and that we saw not the dissolute libertine in the kind generous brother in fact he had many virtues and it was to him we owed our support after the peace of seventeen sixty three restored us to the pleasures of paris then however the count of bellegarde though he resisted every argument which could be brought by the other parts of our family to induce him to receive and forgive us yet was so far adverse to our owing any farther obligation to de Mertville, whom he held in abhorrence and no longer acknowledged as his son that he agreed to make us each a handsome allowance peace being made my brother the baron de rochemont went into germany where during the war he had formed some attachments and i was for several years in garrison with my regiment hearing nothing of my family but what i learned from the letters my sister contrived by stealth to send me after our elopement she had been for some years more rigorously consigned and had suffered inconceivable harshness and cruelty from her father but at the end of six years though his temper was far from being softened by age the death of the jesuit who had been his confessor seemed to have procured some little alleviation to her sufferings a younger and less austere director of the same order had succeeded to the government of his conscience and genevieve now informed me that accustomed as she had been almost from her infancy to confinement the moderate severity of that in which she now lived was comparatively easy to her that her father admitted of her services with more pleasure than he used to do spoke to her with greater kindness sometimes allowed her to walk out and had promised that the daughter of one of his vassals for whom she had conceived a friendship should be allowed to reside with her at the castle as her companion she always added her vexation that this execution of his promise was she knew not why always delayed from time to time though her old governess was becoming quite useless as a companion but her greatest uneasiness seemed to arise from our long and as she began to fear endless separation this regret she repeatedly dealt upon with so much pathetic tenderness that i at length determined to go in secret and in disguise to rochemart and embrace once more this beloved sister for whom long as we had been parted i still felt the warmest affection i was at paris when i made this resolution where a short time before i had formed an intimate acquaintance with a young englishman the second son of a nobleman he was two or three years younger than i was in person remarkably handsome and in manners the most engaging man i ever met with our acquaintance soon became the sincerest friendship and he communicated to me every interesting circumstance that befell him so my situation in regard to my father and my increasing desire to see my sister was no secret to him 
he entered into all my solicitude and encouraged me to indulge this inclination i had to visit rochemart in disguise for the pleasure of seeing genevieve a letter i at that period received from her determined me to hesitate no longer she intimated that her situation was become extremely unpleasant from the extraordinary behaviour of the spanish jesuit who had succeeded old ignatius that this man seemed to have designs of the most improper nature and in regard to her and that it was he who had hitherto opposed her having jacquelina the young person to whom she was attached with her because he foresaw he should then have less frequent opportunities of entertaining her alone finding however the count disposed to indulge her and being unable to form any longer pretences to prevent it he had at last told her that he would immediately influence the count to oblige her if she would consent to ask for the addition of another member to the family and receive as if at her own desire a sister of his who must be a superintendent over both her and her friend and replace the superannuated governess who was no longer capable of her charge to this my poor genevieve told me that she had consented rather than not have the company of jacquelina to cheer her solitude that jacquelina was consequently arrived and the other expected every day but that notwithstanding she had now a companion the jesuit continued to find but too many opportunities to t entertain her with conversation which she could not misunderstand my blood boiled with indignation while i read this letter and i instantly communicated the contents of it to my friend ormond it is not possible said he that you can hesitate my dear chevalier how to act let us set out instantly for rochemart you see a friend ready not only to attend you but to lose his life in your service we departed the next day followed only by two servants and arriving at perpignan began to consult on the means of meeting genevieve without the knowledge of my father or the inhabitants of the castle and the prosperous expedient that occurred to us was to disguise ourselves and our servants as hunters and to watch in that dress till chance should throw my sister in our way i sometimes thought of going openly to my father and making one effort to awaken his paternal feelings to obtain my own pardon and my sister's liberty but after consulting with ormond we agreed that it was better to endeavour to see her first for a failure in the success of this scheme would probably occasion her to be so closely confined that we might never have an opportunity of seeing her at all equipped therefore as izzard hunters we reached this castle and wandered about a whole day in its neighbourhood without any success the weather was so intensely warm for it was now autumn that i believe my sister came out only early in the morning or late in the evening and that the best probability of meeting her was at those hours to take up our abode near the castle therefore was material and i recollected the banqueting house in the wood which had then i imagine been long neglected and where our residence could not be suspected but on entering i was surprised to find it newly fitted up and scrumptiously furnished with every article that could contribute to luxury and repose this had been done by the jesuit's directions and here he now and then made little entertainments for some favourite fathers of the covenant and their female penance which Asipius or mark anthony might have beheld with envy dread of the count's power and severity 
effectually secured every part of his domain from the intrusion of any of the neighboring peasants the pavilion therefore furnished as it was was never locked and as i imagine nobody had so good a right to it as myself i took up my abode in it without much apprehension of being dislodged my friend occupied the other room and our servants found a lodging in the deserted cabin of a shepherd on the other side of the castle from whence they were ordered to watch for the appearance of the ladies we desired to see and immediately on perceiving them to acquaint us the whole of the second day passed as the first had done we wandered about the woods that skirt the castle but all about it appeared the desolate abode of sullen despotism at night when we had no longer anything to fear from the observation of those who might belong to it we approached its walls more nearly and watched the lights at the windows hoping that genevieve might pass with a candle though even then it would have been very difficult if not impossible to have apprised her of our being so near if my friend had been eager for the expedition he was now more earnest for its success the wild and mountainous country around a castle such as is described as the habitation of enchanters and monsters of fable was exactly suited to inflame his ardent and romantic imagination and when to these circumstances was added our purpose to save a young woman from the harsh severity of a father and the wicked hypocrisy of a jesuit he became an absolute enthusiast and vowed like a true knight-errant never to leave the spot till our adventure was successfully accomplished the second night however we were slowly retiring to our pavilion and had almost reached it when we fancied that among the trees on one side of us which were then cut into alleys we heard female voices talking low and plaintively the evening was so profoundly still that we heard every leaf that quivered in the scarcely perceptible air and these voices we now lost now heard more distinctly till at length i was sure that one of them was the voice of genevieve though it was so long since i had heard it i would have flown into her arms but ormond for once was more considerate than i was withheld me by representing to me that if the person with her should be the jesuit sister we should be ruined by our rashness instead therefore of shrewing ourselves abruptly we glided along on the other side of the trillage of beech which entirely concealed us and listening attentively heard distinctly that it was to her friend jacquelina that my sister addressed herself i knew not whether my voice or the sight of me could alarm her least but at length determined to walk from the banqueting house and meet her we both therefore proceeded slowly down the walk in which she was leaning on the arm of jacquelina but neither of them immediately perceived us and i had time for though it was evening every object was yet distinct to observe the wonderful alteration that time had made in the person of my sister i had left her a beautiful girl of twelve years old her fine hair hanging loose over her face and neck and her features though then lovely and expressive not yet formed she was now in her nineteenth year with the figure of a nymph and a countenance beaming with sensibility and sweetness with a sensibility that seemed to have no object and with sweetness that had something of a patient acquiescence infinitely interesting her companion was so beautiful a woman that at any other time i should have been immediately struck with her charms but at this moment i had no eyes but for genevieve and ormond whose heart had been prepared for any impression 
was so fascinated that forgetting my injunctions of silence he exclaimed heaven chevalier you never told me that your sister was an angel at this explanation though not uttered in a loud voice genevieve whose eyes were before fixed on the ground raised them when seeing two men approach she was extremely alarmed and taking jacquelina by the arm she cried here are strangers my friend let us hasten back to the castle no i cried no genevieve it is no stranger but your brother who comes to defend and protect you my brother my dear brother said she what both is it possible can you be both so good i held her in my arms for she was unable to support herself while ormond passionately exclaimed oh would to heaven i were your brother but accept me loveliest of women as your friend and be assured that i will defend so glorious a title with my life she was soon so well recovered as to listen to what i related to her and her beautiful eyes were turned towards ormond full of such expressions as charmed his very soul while she thanked him for having accompanied her dear chevalier from her conversation and from that of her amiable companion i learned that my infatuated father was not only entirely governed by his confessor but had lately shrewn so much attachment to the sister whom he had introduced that there was every reason to apprehend the consequence of the increasing influence of both genevieve however spoke of her father's failings and even of the unreasonable harshness towards her with reluctant sweetness that was bewitchingly interesting and ormond in this short conversation was gone whole ages in love his eyes watched every turn of her countenance his ears drank the soft sounds of her plaintive voice i saw that the beauty the simplicity of genevieve aided by the singularity of her situation and the scene in which he saw her had effected an instance of what has often been denied and often ridiculed love at first sight neither ormond nor my sister nor i were conscious of the course of time but jacquelina at length reminded her that it would be hazardous to be longer absent from the castle she instantly recollected herself and said with a sigh my chevalier we must part when shall we meet again it was agreed that by the earliest dawn of the following morning we would wait for them in the wood near the pavilion we attended them as far as we dared towards the approach to the castle and then slowly and unwillingly bade them good night ormond stood watching my sister as she passed among the trees and when he could see her no longer he hinted to me and said with an energy particularly his own Belgard, i am in love with your sister dis to distraction i am sorry for it my friend said i and why sorry interrupted he with an air of displeasure because replied i this attachment if it indeed becomes permanent though very honourable to her may be a source of misery to you both my father has so great an antipathy to an englishman and a protestant that were a man who is both to possess the world i am convinced he would refuse him his daughter refuse cried ormond do you think i would ask him or do you chevalier mean to leave your sister such as a sister here in his power i hardly know what i mean yet my dear friend let us however do nothing rashly let us endure the objects we wish to serve alas at that time i was cool and collected and could argue with the romantic enthusiasm of my friend 
but in a few days i was as madly in love with jacquelina as ormond was with my sister the impediments between us were as great as those between my friend and genevieve jacquelina was of inferior birth the daughter of one of my father's vassals and to the sullen pride of the count of bellegarde nothing could be so repugnant as such an alliance i was not yet of the age when sons were allowed to dispose of themselves and my allowance from my father would i was well assured be instantly withdrawn if i offended him anew all these considerations however weighed nothing against the violence of my passion and determined as i was to marry jacquelina and to give genevieve to my friend the only difficulty seemed to be to find a priest on whom we might depend for sensible of our affection as were the objects of our love they refused to leave their home unless under the protection of their husbands while i was studying how to find and secure the fidelity of such a man as we had occasion for genevieve endured from the insolence of the jesuit and the encroaching authority of mademoiselle de Achater, his sister insults which she dared not avow to us in all their extent but jacquelina when she was alone with me spake with less reserve and told me she had no doubt but that it was the plan of de Achter, the jesuit to marry his sister to the count and that so entirely was he governed by him that there was no doubt of his falling into the snare this was very unpleasant intelligence but i forgot it when she added that she dreaded every day less the walks genevieve was now allowed to take should she be prohibited it was necessary immediately to hazard something i contrived to make acquaintance with one of the younger monks of the convent he had never seen me as the chevalier de bellegarde and believed for some time that i was a hunter from pau in bern at length when i believed myself tolerably acquainted with him i told him who i was and with what view i had so long fingered about my father's abode from whence i had been many years exiled from the manner of his receiving this intelligence i believed i could trust him it was very hazardous for the fathers of the convent were for the most part decidedly in the interest of the jesuit but i offered to this monk the means of gratifying some of those passions which his poverty and mode of life afforded him little opportunity of indulging and he agreed to do whatever i pleased the rising sun of the following morning saw my friend ormond the enraptured husband of the lovely genevieve and gave me in jacquelina the only woman who seemed to me worthy to be her friend trembling at every breath of air at every whisper of the following leaves they hurried back to the castle where an unusual degree of tranquillity seemed on that day to reign the count spake kindly to his daughter and she encouraged by the certainty of now belonging to the man she loved put a restraint upon herself and behaved with more civility to d'archter and his sister than she could generally command in the evening they met us as usual but our felicity was embittered by the apprehensions for our safety that had taken possession of jacquelina though there is not a peasant or a shepherd round the domains of the castle said she that loves the count well enough to do him any kindness on his own account yet fear may have the influence which affection and gratitude have not some of them have been telling the servants that two strangers have been seen for many days among the mountains 
who call themselves izzard hunters though they have no dogs with them that nobody knows where they sleep or how they live and that they are suspected to belong to a banditti who have for some time infested the valley de arne about the source of the garonne this whisper continued jacquelina terrifies me it was only to-day i heard it and i have never had a tranquil moment since i figure to myself that your lodging in the banqueting house may be discovered that you may be taken up imprisoned punished i endeavored to appease the fears of my angelic wife though i felt that they were too well founded ormond intoxicated by love and knowing less of the manners of the people that i did treated them slightly let them come said he are we not armed the following day however genevieve and jacquelina met us in increased alarm the reports among the servants gained ground the jesuit had heard of them and had said to genevieve and her friend that if such men were lurking about the confines of the castle their early and late walks would become very unsafe and that he must speak to the count to forbid them to remain another night in the pavilion was not safe our little council deliberated what to do and love was the president under his auspices the timid genevieve learned courage to propose what appeared ha more hazardous measure than to remain where we were the eastern side of the castle said she is never inhabited on that side the guard-room and the rooms above and under it have not been open for many years in that quarter you my chevalier may recollect there was a considerable breach made in one of the sieges and the windows are dismantled and broken still as nobody ever goes near that range of rooms would there be much danger in your remaining in them till we can depart the danger cried ormond is no consideration but why should we not depart immediately why should you and jacquelina ever return to the castle to this my sister answered that unless precautions were taken such as she feared we had not thought of our flight would undo us my father said she by the death of that nobleman who was the most powerful among his enemies has obtained the government of rosalind and has even had offers of other advantages which may awaken his dormant and disappointed ambition thus armed with powers to detect our flight consider what would be the consequence of our being missing if we are not sure of getting out of his reach before he can exert the power secure if possible the means of an escape and we will fly in the meantime you must think of your own safety till that can be done we were too much in love to raise any difficulties to a plan which brought us nearer the objects of our affections and the remark genevieve made as to the difficulty of our carrying her and jacquelina with us without some quicker means of conveyance than their delicate limbs afforded them was perfectly just how to procure such conveyance was a matter that required more deliberation than the present moment afforded and it was therefore agreed that at night when all about the castle was quiet genevieve and jacquelina should be at one of the lowest windows on the eastern side and that we should cross the moat and by their aid ascend to that window which we considered a very easy undertaking as it was now late in the autumn and there was no moon it was dark enough for our purpose we crossed the moat with ease and found our lovely conductresses waiting for us with almost equal ease ascended the broken wall and i was thus in my father's house unknown to him and took possession of the paternal mansion of my ancestors as if it had been a robber and an assassin 
Here, however, under such circumstances, I passed the most fortunate period of my life. Ah, short and fleeing felicity, which never, never can return again. We were not, however, so intoxicated with our present happiness as to neglect the means of its continuance, but nothing was so difficult as to carry them into execution. It was only of a night I could get out, for with such a commission I was unwilling to entrust the daring and impetuous Ormond, and the application I made for horse at two or three villages at hours so unreasonable raised such suspicion of my intention that I twice narrowly escaped being seized by the peasants as one of the banditti, and once, on my return to the castle, was watched and compelled, instead of entering it by the window, as usual, to plunge into the woods and conceal myself till the following evening, while my wife, my sister, and Ormond suffered the most cruel anxiety and were almost dead with apprehension. After this unsuccessful sally, they entreated me not to venture out again, and we continued to live on some time longer in security. The immense extent of the castle made our abode in this uninhabited part of the attended with very little rich, for the passages were all stone, and our footsteps could not be heard, even if we had not taken all precautions against noise. The appearance of complacence which Genevieve was compelled to assume towards d'Acheter obtained for her any little favor she chose to ask of him, and he allowed her frequently to dine in her own apartment, while his sister was thus enabled to carry on, with more success, her plan of operations against the heart of the Count, in which indeed she had made a much greater progress than we apprehended. Thus we were supplied with food without raising any suspicion, and were so well content with our consignment, since it was the imprisonment of love that could we have been sure of its continuance with safety to the objects of that love. We should never have regretted our loss of liberty. To this moment I am ignorant of the means by which we were discovered, though I can impute it only to the treachery of the monk who married us. It was after midnight, near five weeks after our residence in the castle, that I was awakened by the loud shriek from Jacquelina, who at the same moment threw her arms about me. I started up and flew to a cutlass, which I usually placed in a chair near the bed, and with which I defended Jacquelina for some moments, till I was stunned by a blow which one of the ruffians who surrounded me aimed at the back of my head, and I recovered not my senses till many hours afterwards, when I awoke in a kind of litter, in which two hideous figures guarded me, with their swords drawn, I was confined by heavy chains, and when I inquired why I was thus fettered like a malefactor, I was shrewn a letter de cachet, which directed me to be conveyed to the Bastille, and thither I was now travelling. Oh, sir, if you have ever loved, you may be enabled to judge what were my feelings. Yet, who was ever so cruelly outraged? Who was ever torn from such a woman, unless it was my unhappy friend Ormond, whose fate I had reason to fear was yet severer than my own, because I doubted whether my father, savage and inhuman as he was, would excise on me exactly the same degree of cruelty which he would feel himself disposed to inflict on one who, in addition to his being the husband of Genevieve, was an Englishman and a heretic. The anxiety I felt for his fate, 
and for that of my sister and the dread of what might have befallen jacquelina whose shrieks as they endeavoured to tear her from me yet vibrated in my ears made me insensible of my own sufferings notwithstanding my wounds and the inconveniences of my confinement but my guards were obstinately silent and neither threats nor entreaties could procure for me the least intelligence of what was to be the fate of the beloved friends from whom they had divided me while any hope remained i retained some degree of composure and recollection but at length despair took possession of me i became delirious furious frantic i was only prevented by my chains from destroying first my keepers and then myself i knew nothing of what happened for many days during the disorder of my senses when i recovered them i was in a room in one of the towers of the bastille so much weakened with the loss of blood that they had taken from me during my frenzy that i could not leave my bed my head had been shaved and i was under the regiment appointed for those who are decidedly insane pardon me if i here ask your patience till to-morrow the recollection of what i then suffered is too painful for me to dwell upon longer and when i think that those sufferings were inflicted by a father here the count put his hand on his heart and sighed deeply willoughby remarked in his eyes that unsettled expression that still bore testimony of the state of mind into which the sufferings he had been relating had thrown him and extremely affected himself by the count's narrative he was glad powerfully as his curiosity was excited to delay hearing the melancholy catastrophe for melancholy he feared it must be till the next day end of volume four chapter ten Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Volume 4, Chapter 11 of Celestina. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Celestina by Charlotte Turner Smith Volume 4, Chapter 11 When the Count de Bellegarde and Willoughby met the next morning, the former seemed perfectly composed, but pensive and melancholy. It was early. He proposed walking towards the convent. And as we go, said he, I will conclude, as briefly as I can, my mournful history. I will not dwell upon the nature of my sufferings in the Bastille. Of much of the time I passed there I have no perfect recollection, and for the rest suffice it to say that, by the orders of my inflexible father, I endured all the rigours of imprisonment, in its most hideous form, for several months, during which I made some attempts to escape, attempts the failure of which only served to convince me of the impossibility of effecting it, and, in the impotency of rage, I cursed my existence, and, I fear, reproached heaven itself for permitting such horrors on earth. The idea of Jacquelina, abandoned to the inhuman vengeance of a man capable of acting with such magnanimity towards his own son, the thoughts of the misery in which I had probably been the means of involving Ormond and Genevieve hardly suffered me to attend to my own wretchedness, when I was capable of feeling it, but many weeks passed in wild ravings about them, and then for myself I felt nothing. I thus lost some of those miserable days, the cause of which, when I was sensible, I marked on the wall of my prison. I had now, 
though my reckoning was thus rendered defective passed near two years in my prison when my barbarous father at the intercession of my brother the baron sent a priest to offer me my release on certain conditions one of which was that i should immediately on leaving my confinement be conducted to my regiment which was then in garrison at lisle and give my parole that i would not quit it without the permission of the commanding officer though i saw that this restriction was intended to prevent my gaining any intelligence of jacquelina of ormond or of my sister i gave the promised desire as being released from my detested prison always seemed a step towards them and two days afterwards the governor of the bastille delivered me to the persons whom my father had sent for me and i was thus conducted like a prisoner to join the regiment where the colonel a friend of the counts took care to take the parole in the strongest manner and believing perhaps that under such circumstances i should not feel myself bound in honour to keep it he continued to have me watched so strictly that i was still in fact a prisoner and thus at the age of twenty-nine was i treated my soul revolting against the tyranny without the means of escaping from it and consuming itself in vain projects to see or to hear from the wife so adored from friends so tenderly beloved a few days however after my arrival at lille my brothers de ermenville and the baron de rochemart came in disguise to find me they hardly knew me so greatly was i changed by despair and confinement but without giving them time to express their concern i inquired for jacquelina for ormond for our sister their countenances particularly that of the baron told me that i had only tidings of sorrow to expect and knowing the state in which my mind had been he studied a moment how to soften them but the impatience of my fear would not give him time tell me cried i tell me where is jacquelina where is genevieve where is my friend ormond they are dead i know they are that inhuman man who calls himself my father has destroyed them all no replied the baron ormond lives and is long since returned to england jacquelina lives but lives not for you she has taken the veil as for our unfortunate sister she is perhaps happier she has been dead some months this cruel intelligence that of the three beings dearest to me on earth i should never again see either was too much for me again i lost the sense of my misery in delirium and it was many days before i could attend to the consolation offered me by the baron or the lighter arguments by which de ermenville attempted to wean me from reflections which it could answer he said no purpose to indulge the state i then fell into was only another species of madness i no longer raved or vented my surly in cries and execrations but i became silent and sullen never spoke but to the baron who still attended me with paternal pity and got leave of the commandant to do so and whatever i said to him was only inquiries after some particulars relative to jacquelina and my sister in which he could not satisfy me all that he knew being from my father or madame de bellegarde for the sister of the jesuit de austerre had long since been raised to that title and had brought the count to paris where he was again admitted to a share of power as had enabled him to execute more securely his unnatural vengeance as i was no longer capable of duty and my malady seemed to be incurably fixed as jacquelina had taken the vows and was for ever out of my reach 
the baron obtained leave for me to go with him to a house he had in normandy where the patient pity with which he watched over me gradually restored me to my senses but i regained them only to feel with keener anguish all the horrors of my destiny the count de bellegarde now far advanced in life and repenting perhaps whenever his new wife gave him leave to think of his cruel treatment of his daughter expressed some inclination to see and forgive me but felt that it was i who had much to forgive and alas i felt too that though he was my father i could not forgive him the first moment in which i enjoyed both reason and liberty i should have used in flying to perpagan where with difficulty i learned that jacquelina was confined but i had promised the baron that i could not yet attempt it and i held my word to him and i held my word to be sacred whatever it cost me to keep it all my present satisfaction was in traversing the sea coast near where my brother's house was situated and looking towards england whence i every day expected to hear of ormond to whom i had written impatiently i waited month after month for an answer i wrote again but i still heard nothing at length i recollected the name of an english gentleman with whom ormond lived in habits of intimacy while he was in france i wrote to him and my letter was immediately answered he informed me that captain ormond who had returned to england about ten months before in a very bad state of health had been ordered very soon afterwards to america with his regiment which was sent thither to quell the troubles which about that time broke out in the english colonies thus i had no longer any hope of seeing my dear friend who was of a disposition to have joined me in my attempt however hazardous for the recovery of jacquelina which i was at all events determined to try at wild and impossible as the project was it had taken such forcible hold of my imagination the reason was no longer heard i concealed my intentions however carefully from my brother affected composure i was far from feeling and as he began to believe my reconciled to my destiny he no longer refused to talk of jacquelina when i calmly led the discourse to that subject and by degrees he told me all he knew which was indeed a little more than the name of the convent where she had taken the veil at perpagan having gained all the instruction i could i left a letter to the baron who had long ceased to insist upon any parole and telling him that being now well enough to return to my duty i should merely see jacquelina take an eternal adieu and then rejoin my regiment i sat out alone in the night and taking by roads arrived at perpagan i found a brother of jacquelina's who was settled there he confirmed all that i heard of the compulsion that had been used by the count to force my unhappy wife to take the veil he had threatened the destruction of her whole family he had imprisoned her father and assured her that i was dead if i shuddered at this relation judge how my tenderness my regret my rage was increased when this brother of my jacquelina went on to speak of what he thought i known that she became a mother during this inhuman persecution and that an infant daughter then existed my sister too had given birth to a daughter and died in consequence of the anguish of mine she suffered at having her child taken from her where are these children cried i in agony that is impossible to describe oh carry me instantly where i may claim them alas sir replied my wife's brother my sister's child was taken by my mother who ill as she could afford it 
would never part with it to the count who offered to provide for it because she doubted what were his designs she doubted indeed with reason for the other baby was sent away to bayonne as was then said but everything relative to it was so secretly managed that nobody knew for a long time what became of it and it was not till some time afterwards that my sister who from her tender affection for mademoiselle bellegarde was anxious for it as for her own persuaded me to inquire about it for we all dreaded to hear that the count under the influence of de archers had been very cruel indeed to it oh sir reflect a moment on my feelings at this detail in the same breath i bade my informer to go on with the account of all he knew of ormond's child and carry me to my own the wilderness of my impatience frightened him he endeavoured to soothe me with assurances that my infant was living and well and told me as gently as he could that he had been guilty of a breach of promise in naming it for that the count had made the whole family enter into an agreement never to let me know anything about the child irritated by this new insistence of barbarity i swore in a transport of passion that i would have my daughter restored to me or perish in the tempt and that i would find the child of my murdered sister if i traversed the world alas my dear chevalier said my wife's brother there will be danger enough for you even in attempting to see your own daughter for the count has never ceased to have it watched but for that of your sister you will certainly never recover it all my researches which i assure you were not indolently nor feeble made traced it no farther than into the house of a certain madame de palier at bayonne a friend of the present madame de bellegard who undertook madame de palier cried willoughby o oh, eternal heaven are you sure merciful god are you sure it was madame de palier amazed at the vehemence and singular manner of willoughby for which he could so little account the count looked at him a moment and then said am i sure yes very sure have you then any knowledge of madame de palier oh if i could tell you cried willoughby in agitation that deprived him of his breath but i cannot tis impossible yet thus much did you recover the daughter of your sister was she ever restored to you no never answered the count all the intelligence i was long afterwards to obtain was that madame de palier had placed her in a convent at hears but her name was changed and before i could obtain after my last return to france even this information the people who had received her were dead and i could only guess from some memorandums kept in the convent that a child whom i guessed to have been the same was taken thence by an english lady it's celestina cried willoughby in the wildest transport it is my own celestina she is mine again without a doubt without any impediment mine he was conscious that at that moment he was not in possession of his senses so extravagant was his joy the count accustomed as he had been to the impulse of violent passions himself was astonished at this frenzy because he comprehended not what he had produced it nor could willoughby for some moments command himself enough to explain it till at length from this paroxysm of agonizing joy he sunk at once with a deep dejection for the possibility had occurred to him that at the very moment when he was exulting in having so wonderfully and so unexpectedly discovered the birth of celestina and thus recovered all his losses she was perhaps 
married and no longer interested for him nor solicitous to inquire on his account to whom she belonged then as every hour's delay might be fatal if this had not already happened he determined to set out instantly for england the wonder however was with which he saw the count survey him recalled his wandering and bewildered senses and as well as he could though very incoherently and inarticulately he related his history to the count monsieur bellegarde had not a doubt but that celestina of willoughby was his niece every circumstance as they became cool enough to compare them answered exactly convinced of this and becoming every instant more partial to his guest the count now entered with the warmest interest into all his apprehensions lest he could lose her and approved of his hastening instantly back to england willoughby now entreated him to return to the castle that he might not waste a moment for on the event of a moment perhaps said he my life depends as they returned however the count concluded his own history and willoughby since celestina was concerned in it commanded that portion of attention which perhaps no other subject however otherwise interesting could at that moment have commanded i was not deterred said the count de bellegarde by any of the threats that my father had uttered but i flew to the convent where jacquelina was it was guessed by my impatience and ardour who i was and i was refused admittance to the grate i then had recourse to the disguise of a female dress and in despite of all the menaces that had been thrown out against their family i prevailed on one of her sisters to accompany me i saw her but she did not know me her eyes were cast down she was pale and thin resignation and patience seemed to have softened the horrors of her destiny but they gave to her faded beauty an interest so powerful that i never loved her so ardently as that moment i would have forced myself through the grate which was one of those that are so narrow as scarcely to omit a hand i threw myself against it i spoke to her then she knew me and caught hold of the bars to save herself from falling i kissed her hand in the wildest transorts i besought her to remember that her vows were not could not be binding either in the sight of god or man that she was my wife and that against the infamity rani that had had divided us all nature revolted thus i raved while tears such as angels shed fell from her lovely eyes o oh, bellegarde said she when she was able to speak this is all vain and frantic rage learn my dear dear friend to submit as i do to a fate which cruel as it is is inevitable i am dead to you for from hence no power no force can release me ah they told me you were no more or never never would i have taken those vows which my heart refused but it is done and this short moment is the last we shall ever have at this instant the superior of the convent and several nuns appeared and severely reproaching her forced her from the grate inhuman said she even this last moment is denied me farewell my dear bellegarde farewell for ever believe i am dead and transfer the tenderness you felt for your jacquelina to her little anzoletta in her i still live this sentence was hardly articulate amid the efforts her prosecutors made to force her away when i lost sight of her again i threw myself frantically against the grate that divided i beat my head against it fury and despair possessed me anew and i became for some days again insensible 
or sensible to nothing but the sight of my little girl whose innocent smiles appeased my rage and made me recollect that there was yet a being in the world for whom i ought to live every calm interval was employed in projects more wild perhaps than my wildest ravings to force jacquelina from her accursed imprisonment i talked about it continually to her brothers and persuaded myself that nothing was impossible to a man so injured and so attached as i was my father however was too powerful in a province where he was governor and in a community in which he had influence to get jacquelina received notwithstanding her resistance and even her marriage at this time power did everything in france and nature and justice were silence thank god it is so no longer in this ejaculation willoughby most sincerely joined and the count proceeded my father as i was about to observe was too well served to leave me any probability of success in this mad project far from being able to procure the liberty of my wife i could rot preserve my own but was under pretence of my insanity carried away a prisoner from perpagan and the only favour the baron could obtain for me was that i might be confined in his house in normandy here i remain only a short time sunk again into the impotent fullness of despair when the regiment to which i belonged was ordered to america and my father desired i might go i wished for death and had i any motives to desire life my honour compelled me not to hesitate for america then i embarked and on my arrival my first care was to inquire for the english regiment in which my friend ormond had a company i heard from deserters that it had suffered greatly in the beginning of the war and was ordered back to england even the mournful satisfaction which had promised myself in embracing my friend the husband of my beloved unfortunate genevieve seemed thus to be denied me every circumstance contributed to promote that desperation that impatience of life which is the effect of incurable calamity before i left france i had recommended my infant and zoletta to the care of the baron in case of my death and secured to her all the property that would be at my disposal on the death of my father i thought that were jacquelina dead i should think of her with less painful regret than i did now languishing within the walls of a monastery of my natural friends only the baron and de ermontville affected to feel any interest in my fate the former was now deeply engaged in the duties of his profession as a soldier and for the latter he was decidedly a disciple of epicurus and made a rule of his life to enjoy every possible pleasure and avoid every possible pain of course my loss would be but slightly felt by either of my brothers and my father for so many years my persecutor and tyrant would rejoice at it i continually sought death as my only refuge against the evils he had inflicted upon me and what was called bravery was in fact despair in one of the reconnoitres which our troops and the revolted americans had with the english army it was my chance to be stationed to defend a small post on the borders of an immense wood with a small detachment of french the engagement was warm between the main bodies but the troops under my command were not called into the action impatient to be thus idle i sent one of my aides-de-camp to the general representing that we were absolutely useless where we were and entreating his leave to advance when he returned and told me 
that the battle was over with disputed success that the english had suffered greatly particularly their officers while the americans and french hardly in a better condition were making their retreat which i was directed to cover with my fresh troops i advanced therefore through the wood by the way i was directed and after proceeding half a mile i met a party of indians in the interest of the colonists carrying with them an english officer who was they said mortally wounded by his uniform he appeared to be of rank i approached him and spoke to him in french judge of my sensations when i saw in this dying prisoner my friend my ormond not even the calls of duty were so pressing as those of friendship i even deliberated a moment whether i should not hazard everything to attend him myself but when i expressed this though he could hardly speak he conjured me to go on and merely to take him out of the hands of the indians i know i must die said the gallant fellow but i would die in your hands if you can without injury to your honour grant me such an indulgence i ordered a guard to convey him with the utmost care to the nearest french quarters and then hastened to obey the orders i had received i had the happiness successfully to execute them and having done so hurried to my friend i found he had received every assistance which in the situation we then were could be given him he was easy and though his wounds were mortal his death was not likely to happen immediately he thanked me as soon as he again saw me for my attention to him and then eagerly asked me after his wife and his child but she is dead cried he my genevieve is dead i was but too certain of that before i left europe my silence my tears confirmed the sad truth well my dear chevalier cried he clinging my hand i am following her fast i knew what you would tell me of my infant of that dear pledge of my genevieve's affection your inhuman father has eluded your search as did mine oh i could curse him but i will not because he is your father if ever your friendly solicitude for the offspring of your sister and your friend should enable you to discover her give her these pictures they are those of her father of his favorite sister of her mother see added he this resemblance of genevieve which she gave me when i received the dear avowal of her love never till now has it left my bosom and i conjure you bellegarde never to part with it till you place it on that of my daughter my noble friend lingered a few days longer not in great pain however and perfectly sensible and then in my arms he resigned his gallant spirit to his god this loss added strength to the gloomy resolution i had before made to die among my friend's papers which by his order his servant delivered to me after his death i found a narrative of all he had done after his release from imprisonment in the bastille at the demand of the english ambassador for he was there part of the time that i was though we never saw each other to gain admittance to his wife and to have his child restored to him and such an abhorrence did this add to that i had already conceived against my father that i could not bear the name of bellegarde nor endure to think of returning to breathe the same air with a man whom i considered as a monster to france however i returned without even a wound in all the hazards to which i had voluntarily exposed myself this inhuman father was still living but my brother the baron de rochemart had fallen at the head of his regiment at the attack made on the island of jersey and i succeeded to his fortune a fortune which ample as it was 
could make me no amends for the excellent kind brother i had lost alas i had lost two brothers and two friends equally dear to me they were not to be recalled but i still found a gloomy kind of satisfaction in complying with their last requests that of my brother de rochemart was that i would take his name and most willingly i quitted that of bellegarde the dying request of my beloved friend i endeavoured ah how vainly endeavoured to fulfil i never could discover his daughter till this fortunate day but my residence among the americans had awakened in my mind a spirit of freedom the miseries the irreparable injuries i had received from ill place and exorbitant power prompted me to assert it i was now possessed of considerable property useless to me because jacquelina could not share it though comparatively free myself i was wretched in this disposition it may easily be imagined that if i possessed the power i was not without inclination to add a fuel to that fire which immediately after the end of the war in america was kindled though it yet burnt but feebly in france i wrote i acted upon my newly acquired principles with the energy of a sufferer and with the resolution of a martyr i was already the martyr of despotism and ruined in my happiness for ever i knew that all the vengeance i could excite could injure me no farther i now saw jacquelina but she was still pining within her convent i saw my child i held her to the grate while her mother bedewed her little hands with tears which i kissed off it was a scene to move every heart but such as inhabited the breast of my father again the hopelessness of rescuing my wife from her cruel bonds gave him occasion to put other fetters on me in the rashness of my desperation i said i wrote i acted such things as made me be considered by government as a dangerous person my father took advantage of my rashness he represented me as being disordered in my senses and obtained an order for shutting me up in the fortress of mont saint michel between four and five years i had been a captive in that gloomy prison where the glorious flame of liberty of which i only saw the first feeble rays burst forth i regained my personal freedom when my country became free i found my father dead everything he could give away his wife possessed but this and some other of his estates were mine and de ermontville gave me with the hands which then gave the title of bellegarde the name which i abhor and which though it is yet given me by the people who have been accustomed to give it to the head of my family i will not keep but take that of montignat which is my untitled name the original designation of our family the first use i made now of the general and particular freedom in which i rejoiced was to fly to pepingan but the moment is not yet come when i can deliver my imprisoned jacquelina i am however assured that she will very soon be restored to me in that hope i come hither to attend to my long neglected affairs and to enjoy the society of my daughter even greater happiness has been the consequence of my abode here than i dared to hope for by you my friend towards whom the moment i saw you i was impelled by an invincible propensity i shall i trust recover the dear orphan child of genevieve and ormond in a few days i shall go back to perpagan leave anzaletta again in the care of her mother's family and then hasten to assist in the glorious business of securing the liberty of france yes the immortal work of defending myriads yet unborn from over suffering the oppressions under which i have groaned 
here the count of bellegarde ended his narrative and willoughby with an inexpressible contrariety of sensations joy and hope fear and apprehension being furnished with every assurance he could wish of the real parents of celestina took a tender leave of the count and ansletta whose voice was to him as the voice of a seraph promising him felicity to come and then he departed as had been agreed upon between him and the count for pepagan where he delivered at the grate a letter to jacquelina of whom the count had desired that she would describe to willoughby any particulars of the person of his wife which she recollected for in her care the infant celestina had been left a few weeks with trembling impatience willoughby waited while the interesting and still lovely nun perused the letter and heard her while his heart sunk with apprehension thus described the child of her unfortunate friend she was said jacquelina fairer than my child and her features greatly resembled those of her father on her neck a little on the left side were three remarkable though diminutive moles it is enough said willoughby those moles are on the lovely neck of celestina a thousand times i have kissed them as we played together in our infancy and here on this portrait of her drawn when she was about twelve years old they are described jacquelina kissed the picture little as can be judged from the likeness done so many years afterwards i feel an assurance said she that this is the picture of my genevieve's child may heaven grant her those blessings which in its unsearchable decrees it refused to my lovely luckless friend willoughby who would not have been a moment detained by any interview less interesting or less necessary now took his leave and with the utmost expedition though all he could make answered but ill to his impatience he hastened on towards england end of volume four chapter eleven recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c